Well, I think the first demonstration is going to have to be democratic unity, uh, all parts of the Democratic Party coming together in an enthusiastic way for Kamala Harris. Uh, elites in the party have managed this coming together extremely well, and there's been also a ground swell of support from the rank and file. Uh, so that has to maintain itself, and it will have to maintain itself in the face of what might be some very large pro-Palestinian demonstrations that are being planned for Chicago at this time. Uh, she's going to have plenty of backers, uh, plenty of Democratic celebrities, but in her own speech, she has to present herself to the American people and, and spin a narrative that is convincing to them that she can handle the promise and responsibilities of the presidency. You say she'll have an early test at the convention if pro-Palestinian protesters turn out in force in Chicago. Can you expand on that for me and why this might be a controversy point for Harris? Well, a portion of the uh, Democratic base uh, has been very angry with Biden and, by extension, Kamala Harris about insufficiently taking up the issue of death of so many civilians in Gaza, and they want at very at the very least an immediate ceasefire, and beyond that, they want a halt to military shipments to Israel. And portions of the Democratic Party base have embraced this particular policy, uh, and it's going to be a divisive issue, uh, or could be at the convention. The fact that this is occurring in Chicago, which was the site of massive anti-Vietnam War protests in 1968 is not lost on anybody uh, at that convention. And there was crazy rioting in the streets then ultimately, which hurt the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party has to allow the its pro-Palestinian faction to uh, air its grievances, but it also has to maintain calm and, and unity. And that's gonna be one of the challenges of the convention. By the way, Harris comes into this with some significant momentum behind her, and you also get the sense that the Trump campaign is struggling to find its footing here, working out how to react to this resurgent candidate on the other side. What does Trump need to do to regain some of the media spotlight, some of the attention, and some of the momentum? And you also said recently that you believe he might regret his pick of VP. Can you expand on that as well? Well, he picked J.D. Vance at a moment when the all the polls were showing a great uh, pointing toward a victory for Trump, where Biden was being rejected by huge numbers of Americans. And he felt that either Biden was going to continue and be a weak candidate or Kamala Harris would be his replacement and she would be very, very weak as well. So he chose J.D. Vance, who sits militantly to his right on a whole number of issues. Uh, not anticipating that Biden would drop out as quickly as he did and that Kamala would uh, enter the political arena with such a blast of wind at her back and doing so well and achieving degrees of eloquence, focus, decisiveness that not anyone expected her to display. If he had known that this kind of challenge was coming, if she had known, if he had known that she was going to generate this kind of support among Democratic voters and people beyond Democratic ranks, I think he would have uh, chosen someone to his left, uh, at someone at the center. If you imagine him choosing someone like Nikki Haley, I think he would have walked into the White House because the election is going to be very close and it's going to be likely decided by uh, uh, small slivers of moderate, uncommitted voters. And uh, Vance is going to have trouble getting Trump those voters. He chose Vance at a moment of great hubris in a way. He thought the election was sewn up and he said, let me just go ahead with my instincts uh, and my values and we're going to double down. He should have been shrewder about this, choosing someone to guard against a kind of Kamala event. You know, 